adventure not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut well good day nature nuts you know actually it is a good day it's salamander day and salamanders are extremely cool critters. They're very popular, especially with young people, almost as popular as frogs. Now I live in Alberta and around my place there's only one species of salamander. So I thought, well, we're gonna have to do a little traveling. Where do you go for salamanders though? We could have gone to the Eastern deciduous forests where they have such things as the Yonalosi salamander, the marbled salamander, the red salamander and the green salamander. These are plastic, of course. They're part of the Tennessee Aquarium's collection of salamander replicas, beautiful things. We live, by the way, in the golden age of plastic critters, and these are some of the best I've ever seen. Or, for that matter, we could have gone to Europe. We might have seen the crested newt or the European fire salamander, but instead we came here the Pacific Northwest is a superb place for salamanders. We're on Vancouver Island, and there are all sorts of wonderful salamanders to be found here. Live salamanders, real salamanders, not plastic salamanders. Oh, by the way, did you know that in ancient times they used to think that these fire salamanders were actually fireproof? That's why they're called fire salamanders. They're not fireproof at all. But I guess when, you know, you'd have a forest fire and you'd see them crawling out of burning logs, and they've always got a little smile on their face, so they may have looked like they didn't mind, but they did. They're not fireproof. It's baloney. There's lots of stuff we have to learn about salamanders. The first thing we should think about is what salamanders really are anyway. Some scientists think salamanders are closely related to frogs, while others view them as separate branches on the tree of life. You know, one of the most common salamanders around here is the western red-backed salamander. And there are so many western red-backed salamanders in these forests, like this one right here, that not only do they outnumber all the other vertebrates, all the birds and mammals and reptiles and other amphibians, but they also outweigh them. If you put them all together, they would weigh more than all those other critters combined. Have a look at this one. Like I say, it's a western red-backed salamander and it does have a sort of a rusty red stripe down its back. It's a beautiful camouflage pattern at this time of year. Beautiful little critters and they are lungless salamanders. In other words, they don't have any lungs. What they do is they're small enough and they're long enough and skinny enough that they can breathe through their skin and through the lining of their mouth. That's why you can always see their, uh, their chin going up and down because they're always taking air in and out of the mouth and that's how they breathe. Very, very interesting. This is one species of lungless salamander. It's a very, very successful group with many species around here. We might also find the Ensatina. It's a gorgeous pale salamander with a very cute chihuahua-like face and the very typical grooves that all lungless salamanders have between their nostrils and their upper lip. It gives them a square-lipped appearance and it makes them very handsome salamanders. Another species you can find around here is the clouded salamander, and it's called clouded because it has a sort of a, a mottled look to it. It's a rather dingy looking salamander, but it's still quite handsome. You rarely see them in the open because they have a habit of burrowing right in to rotting logs and rotting wood. And for that reason, 
They can survive even in a forest fire, and you'll find them in forested areas after the fire has gone through. You remember the business about salamanders not being fireproof? Well, they're not fireproof, but if the log they're living in doesn't burn, wood is a tremendous insulator and it will protect them from the heat. So they're very adaptable creatures. These lungless salamanders, what with their amazing lack of lungs, the fact that uh, some of them don't have larvae, I think all of them don't have larvae. They just lay eggs, or some of them don't even lay eggs. They just give birth to live young. This is anything but a primitive lifestyle. It's a unique evolutionary path that other vertebrates have never even dreamed of. You know, the difference between lizards and salamanders can be a really perplexing one. It shouldn't be, but it can be. After all, they've both got four limbs and a long tail. Now, I've got both lizards and salamanders in this tank, and I want you to have a close look at them. Let's look at the lizards first. They have dry skin, and their skin is completely covered with scales. And those scales, I mean, they're beautiful, very intricate, very tiny in the case of these lizards, but they cover the entire surface of the skin. Now, another thing that distinguishes lizards is the fact that they can complete their entire life cycle away from water. They either lay eggs that are more or less waterproof, or they give birth to live young. Now, if you contrast that with the salamander in the little pond here, salamanders don't have scales on their skin, and their skin is always moist, even when they're not swimming. Now, you can see that fairly fairly easily here, although this little guy does have bumpy skin. It's not scaly skin, and uh, it's difficult to tell the difference between salamanders and lizards just on general principles alone. Salamanders are amphibians. Lizards are reptiles. More familiar amphibians would be frogs, and we've got a few frogs in here as well. Very easy to recognize frogs. They have no tail. The oldest salamander fossils are about 160 million years old, the same as the oldest birds. But you know, I really haven't had any trouble telling lizards from salamanders since I was in about grade two. And it's not because lizards have a different look to them. Lizards, they have a more sort of finely featured look. Most of them have pointier looking heads and they just I don't know, they look more, more well-engineered, especially their little fingers. You look at a salamander and ah, they're just kind of, kind of rubbery looking. Not that that's a bad thing, but they are a bit rubbery looking, a little bit flat-headed looking, and especially their pudgy little feet. They have very pudgy feet. There are no salamanders in Africa or Australia and very few in South America. Well, let's talk about mole salamanders now. Mole salamanders, it's a whole family of salamanders, the Embistomatidae, and they include some of the most impressive, totally cool salamanders I know of. Now, here's one. This is a beauty. This is the salamander I know best. It's not from around here. In fact, it's a, appearing here courtesy of our friend Trent Garner in the University of Victoria. This is a tiger salamander. It's a goofy looking thing. It's got a, it's got a certain uh, sort of tiger-like pattern on it. Look at how big and chunky this critter is. Look at the size of its mouth. They'll eat just about anything they can catch and kill. Other amphibians, they'll even eat, you know, little mice and things if they can catch them, although that's certainly not their normal diet. They'll eat a lot of bugs and worms and slugs and, you know, whatever. Look at those bulgy eyes. There's not a trace of intelligence in that face. And yet, it's a beautiful critter. I love him. We saw another mole salamander a couple of episodes back. You might remember the long toed salamander. And that one was living in a little hole, a mossy hole in the ground, which again gives you a good idea of why they're called mole salamanders. Once they're adults and they move out of the ponds, they, uh, they do kind of like hanging out in, uh, in holes in the ground. Now here's another one. This one is native 
to the Pacific Northwest. This is not a full grown one, it's a yearling. And uh, that is a Northwestern salamander, a beautiful little thing. It doesn't have the tiger pattern, but it's still a gorgeous animal. Now, the Northwestern salamander has kind of a warmer, brown eyed look to it than the tiger salamander. The tiger salamander looks a bit psycho up close. But you know, neither one of them appears to be terribly intelligent when you look it right in the eye. But they don't need to be intelligent. They've got a plan for life that they've been using since the Mesozoic era. It works for them. They don't really have to think about things because they already know exactly what they're doing. Now it's time for a few scenes of total nudity. If you're still stuck on the comparison between lizards and salamanders, you're going to be even more perplexed by the question of how you tell the difference between a newt and a salamander. The answer is newts are just one type of salamander. They are salamanders in the family Salamandridae, or salamandrids for short. So all salamanders are salamanders, except newts, which are salamandrids, technically. Isn't that just another one of those situations. Anyway, I haven't kept newts as pets since I was a kid, so I just got this little gang of newts a while back, and I have to tell you, so far, I don't get it. I don't understand what the attraction of newts as pets are. I mean, they're beautiful. These are Japanese fire-bellied newts. They have a beautiful red belly with either black markings on it, or some of them don't have very many markings, and that is an indication to predators that they're poisonous. It's the, it's the usual sort of situation with red and black coloration, and they have a nice flattened tail, flattened from side to side, so they can swim with it. But you know, they're just the dumbest critters I've ever seen in my life. They must live in places where food is everywhere, because you give them food and they can't find it. I mean, I gave them a fly. How disappointing. They couldn't catch a fly if it was right in front of their face, which it often is. I think that's the safest place in the world to be a fly is in this newt tank. Give them their frozen blood worms, expecting some kind of big feeding frenzy. <sighs> they can smell the blood worms. Some of them can find the blood worms. They look underneath the bloodworm dish, they look on the side of the bloodworm dish, they push the bloodworm dish around. Even when they go into the bloodworm dish, they can't find the bloodworms. Some of them have the sense to sort of gulp some in. They don't bite the way you and I would bite a sandwich. They gulp, they go <gasps> and then they hope that they get something edible in their mouth and then they swallow it if they're... Anyway, I get quite a kick out of them. If you ever have one of those days where you're feeling you know, at school or at work, like everybody else is a little smarter than you and you're feeling kind of inadequate. Come home, watch your newt tank. You'll feel like a genius in moments. Most fossil salamanders were aquatic, but many modern species live on land. Now there is a species of wild newt that lives here. Sounds good, doesn't it? Wild newt. It's the rough-skinned newt, and it's apparently quite common, and this is apparently not a bad pond for finding wild newts, rough-skinned newts. They sit out in the open a lot because they don't worry about things. They're so terribly poisonous that they don't have many uh, fears in this world. So let me show you the rough-skinned newt. And as you can see, it's a beautiful newt. It has a very colorful belly not as colorful as a fire-bellied newt, but still colorful enough to warn predators that this animal is toxic. In fact, the amazing thing is that apparently the, the, uh, the toxic compound in the skin in this newt is the same one that's found in the poisonous pufferfish or blowfish, the ones that if they're prepared incorrectly and you eat one, you'll die right there at the dinner table which is not a good thing. It's quite interesting, but it's a lovely creature. This one is very gentle. I'm not worried about it. I'm going to wash my hands after I handle it. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous newt. So, there you have it. Very successful salamander of the West Coast, the rough-skinned newt. Bye.
skin it thin. Cause some are so laid back that they can breathe through their skin to make it without lungs. It must be long and thin. Some are so laid back that they can breathe through their skin. Salamanders are amphibians. Salamanders are not dangerous. Some are brightly colored, and you know what that means. They're either poisonous or amorous. They want to be seen. Some are brightly colored, and you know what that means. They're either poisonous or amorous. They want to be seen. Salamanders are not fireproof. Salamanders are amphibians. What they like to eat If you're inviting them to dinner Don't forget the meat Bugs and nails and fish are what they like to eat If you're inviting them to dinner Don't forget the meat Time to talk about fossil salamanders, and we have some extremely rare, priceless, irreplaceable salamander fossils here today, courtesy of Jim Gardner, a graduate student with the Laboratory for Vertebrate Paleontology of the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta, formerly the Departments of Zoology and Geology. Have a look at these fossils. Absolutely lovely. This one is especially nifty. It's a block of rock with the remains of three separate salamanders in it. The name of this fossil salamander is... Um, this salamander fossil is so new that it doesn't even have a name. That's the cool thing. It's the oldest fossil salamander in North America, about 150 million years old, from Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. And you can see that there are a number of lines of vertebrae, backbones, along here. And they look very much like the vertebrae of salamanders today. Can we have a look at that, Jim? Sure can, John. Okay, there's a vertebral column from a modern newt. And here, even more distinctive, the lower jaws of those ancient salamanders which look very much like the lower jaws of a tiger salamander that we would find around today. Once you get the hang of it, interpreting these salamander fossils is a piece of cake. Now, let's have a look at this second fossil. This is a single backbone, a single vertebra from Piceoherpeton from the Paleocene Epoch, about 50 some million years old. And, actually my question is, how do we know this is a salamander vertebra and not 
A fish vertebrate looks like something you'd find in a can of salmon. Jim? Well, John, if I can just take this from you. If we look at this vertebra, you can see that on the side there's a pair of these processes that extend out from the side of the vertebra. Now, in life, the ribs would attach onto the ends of these two processes. So these two processes that we would call double-head rib bearers, they're your key to identifying salamander vertebra. Thank you, Jim. Double-headed rib bearers. Always look for the double-headed rib bearers. Uh, you might even do that if you find one in a can of salmon. Might not be salmon. Anyway, this was from a huge salamander. Compare the size of this. I mean, it's obviously bigger than those newt vertebrae. Here we've got the vertebral column of an Amphiuma, which is a fairly big salamander from southeastern U.S. Just think of it. Take yourself back in your mind to the days after the extinction of the dinosaurs. The world was ruled by giant salamanders like Piceoherpeton. Some salamanders lay eggs that hatch into tadpole-like larvae, while others hatch into fully formed miniature salamanders. Well, it's too bad they didn't put a hellbender in this collection. A hellbender is a gigantic, wrinkly, super ugly salamander that lives in the eastern U.S. It would take a lot of plastic to build a fake hellbender. Wonderful creatures. My friend Andy has a good hellbender story. He used to share an office with a salamander specialist when he was a student. And this uh, salamander guy, he had a pet hellbender in the office for inspiration or something like that. Andy came in one morning, he was the first one in, and he was just setting down to his desk, getting ready to go to work, and the hellbender burped. And Andy swears that it made a sound that sounded like, good morning. And it upset him so much, he had to take the rest of the day off. It's a story that science cannot explain. I love stories like that. That's why I'm a nature nut, and I hope you are too. See you again next time. Good morning. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut.